Chris Lee and Blake Lovell of Southeastern 14 continuing our preview series of state of the programs heading into 2023. We are doing this one, which is Vanderbilt, on January 25th. So when you watch this, things could have changed, but we call it as we see it on this date. And Blake, let's rewind to last year. A weird season for Vandy. 350 plus point times, losses. How many times can we say that? Uh, really? Well, I, mean, I, I know they're they're the yeah. kind of the poster child for weird, but uh, a what a 50 something point win to open the season. Upsets of Florida and Kentucky, the latter being on the road, and, and a five and seven season, which on balance, given what Clark Lee inherited, I think was a success in year two. I mean, it was it was weird because the the pad was really bad. You know, of course, the blowouts were also to Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee. But on balance, I, I think you saw a lot of improvements in year two that leaves you optimistic for 2023, thinking uh, this could be his his best one yet in his third year. Yeah, I mean, look, I you know, we're kind of joking, but it's like, you know, uh, if they just won the games they should have won last year, you could yeah. call it a success. And to be honest, there were only three games you thought they should have won, right? Why Elon and the Northern, Northern Illinois, Illinois game, which at that point we even were kind of eh, we think they should win it. They were underdogs in, in every game but those three. Yeah. So and that one was closer, you know, than than maybe you would have expected. But in terms of like going into the game, what's your thoughts on? I mean, you expected them to lose Wake Forest, and you know, that was when you know Sam Hartman was just like, Okay, well that's that's a difference maker right there. And so yeah, and so they they win those games and you're thinking, all right, well now it's just, you know, you're playing with house money, right? Like, cause no one really expects you to get beyond three wins. Well, <laughs> they get a two game winning streak. They, get a, they build a winning streak in sec play, which has not happened in a while for Vanderbilt. Uh, they it beat Kentucky 26 in a row. Yeah. So not only do you snap your losing streak, but you actually have a winning streak in sec play where you win at Kentucky and then beat Florida. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, it has to be a success in that regard. Now, is it a success, you know, in the context of other programs and all that in the sec, maybe not, but for Vanderbilt, again, we, we know where they were at, uh, when you have a 26 game losing streak in league play that tells you exactly where the program is. And so absolutely it's a success. Um, you know, and that's why I think probably the, the loss to Tennessee to end the season was was disappointing. Um, not just because they lost, it's how they lost because it seemed like, all right, like, you know, this is, and even like you look at the games before that, right. Like about the South Carolina game, the Missouri game, totally winnable game. Um, yeah. You know, so, I mean, you're talking about a team that really is a couple plays away, maybe from getting to a bowl. And we would have never thought that coming into the season. No. Um, so absolutely. I, I think it's a success. And, and I know people, you know, on the outside that, our Vanderbilt fans that'll, you know, scoff at that and laugh at it and all that. And that's fine. But this was a program that had bottomed out when you lose that many games in a row in SEC play. There's no other way to put it. And now at least you have something that you can point to and say, here is our blueprint for success. Like, this is how we do it. And now, as usual in this era, you kind of start over a little bit in a few areas, um, you know, with guys transferring out and such. But Still, I think at least you have some momentum as a program that has not been there in quite a while. Well, look, and, and just for people, like if you're a Vanderbilt fan, you know this, but if you're not, you may not. Um, the, the program, and we both live in the Nashville area, that Clark Lee took over was about as bad as I remember Vanderbilt being. Uh, Vanderbilt, it, as bad as it had been, had never been – Oh, for a season, which it was the year before Clark Lee took over. They didn't even play the final game against Georgia uh, because players on that team between COVID, but mostly uh, being fed up over certain decisions involving kicking personnel, uh, quit the team, and they didn't have enough to play the Georgia game. But anyway, that's another story. Um, yeah, it was it was in a bad place. I said before the year, I think, if that if he had won – four games he deserved sec coach of the year consideration and he won five so there you go all right looking into 2023 i think vanderbilt pins a lot of its hopes on aj swan who frankly i think is an nfl prospect at quarterback mike wright who won their two games at quarterback is now at mississippi state where he'll back up will rogers they do have ken seals still around 
who was their starter a couple of years ago and actually is a true freshman, I think had two or three 300 yard passing games in that winless season. So Vanderbilt's got some depth at quarterback, but Swan unquestionably will be the guy heading into 2023 and, and did enough to excite people a year ago. Well, I mean, again, this is not to knock the other guys, but this feels like the first time in a while that you actually feel like there is high, there's higher upside with the offense because of, I think yeah. the quarterback situation, it feels much more, not just like, you know, who the guy's going to be, but like, you know, who the guy's going to be. And this guy's got something like in terms of like looking ahead into the future, perhaps at the NFL level, like he's got something. And so I think that's where, again, you talk about the optimism. I feel like that, that he is someone that gives them, you know, much more optimism now looking at what he can do. And so I'm excited to see that. Right. Because I mean, we, we talked about it last year. Like he's just someone that you can tell has the tools and look, he's a freshman, right? I mean, he's a freshman last year. And so it's like, that's just like step one. And, and like, you're seeing, you're more looking at it as the potential and what he can do. But now, all right, he's a year older and he's got more experience. He's got another, you know, full off season under his belt. He can do a lot of more different things. Maybe um, there's more chemistry between him and the guys who have been there. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's exciting to actually look at and feel like, again, you've got someone that I think for the first time in a while, it feels like he is, he is on a path to, have at least the chance to play at the, at the next level in the NFL. And um, because he's got the, the skill set, he's AJ Swan is a very good player and I'm excited to see what he can do. So, well, he's got parts around him too. His receiving yeah. core, he's got Will Shepard, who was, I think a second or third team, all SEC guy, depending on where you got your all SEC teams, nine touchdown catches, uh, needs to to work on ball security. So does Jaden McGowan. Uh, but McGowan is one of the fastest guys in league. He played out of the slot as a true freshman, caught, what, 44 balls for 453 and also ran for 67 yards. So he's been productive. Quincy Skinner uh, and Gamarian Carter have flashed things at times. It is not – it's not LSU or Tennessee, don't get me wrong, but it's better than most Vanderbilt groups. Um, running back is going to be their issue. Yeah. They had serious depth problems there last year. Um, Ray Davis is now at Kentucky, and, and Davis had a really good season, ran for, what was it, 1,042 yards, but Davis also is not a breakaway back. He's kind of a if you remember Ralph Webb that played at Vandy, there's some similarities there that neither of them are going to bust a lot of long runs on you for the most part, uh, but they're going to consistently get yards three, four at a time. So I don't know what Vanderbilt does at running back. Um, I think they brought in three freshmen, so probably those guys will have a look. But offensive line, Blake, they lose Jacob Brammer, who started at right tackle for them a lot, but they played a lot of guys, and I think – Every single one of those guys other than Brammer is back. And cohesiveness on the offensive line and depth are two things that you really need. And Vanderbilt should have some of both coming into next year, which that's been a while since we have been able to say that. Yeah, and I think it's – you know, let me just turn A.J. Swan loose and just let him throw it 50 times a yeah. game, right? Just let's go air raid here because – like you said, I mean, if you're just looking back at last year and you're kind of looking ahead and wondering what the running back situation is going to look like, I mean, what rushing – he talks about the rushing yards. Davis was over 1,000. Um, what I think – Davis and Wright accounted for, was it 13 or 14 rushing touchdowns? And I don't think they had many others outside of that, outside of maybe just a couple, what, short – probably Not much. Yeah. yeah, I mean, probably short plays, you know, short yardage, maybe goal line stuff. I don't remember, but – um, I think what Patrick Smith had one. So th those guys accounted for, for they have one returning rushing touchdown. And that's yeah, Patrick that's Smith. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, I, I thought that was probably about it, but so you're, you're, you're basically starting over there. And I think it is interesting. Like you said, they got some, some young guys they'll bring in that it's just that, that I think is one of the storylines going into, you know, here in the off season now, as we, we head towards the spring is just, what does it look like at that position? Because, 
obviously, you know, that's important, but I, I'm also intrigued because you, you know, someone's going to come out of that group where all of a sudden you're looking at and saying, all right, well, there's, you know, there's the guy maybe, or, um, you know, a couple guys who have a chance to, to be really good. But I also think it's, cur- you know, you're curious because uh, does that change like, you know, any of the stuff in terms of how the offense is structured and, um, you know, again, like you said, knowing kind of the weapons that he does have to work with and the offensive line, you know, seems like it can, it can help as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, look, it hurts losing Davis. Like you said, it, it maybe it's not exactly just in terms of the breakaway and that kind of stuff, but still, I mean, he's someone that was, you know, again, did go over a thousand yards and in, in this league, that's never, never easy to do. Um, but I, I'm curious to see how it plays out from just the standpoint of how they structure their offense, kind of knowing they're starting over at running back and which of these guys emerges, you know, maybe to be the guy or, you know, maybe it's a by committee type thing and um, where that production comes from. And again, do they having an offensive line that can, you know, certainly help you do some things. I, I am, I'm, I'm very interested to see, you know, what their offense looks like heading into next season. And maybe just, again, just from a stylistic standpoint and scheming wise, what they try to do based on the personnel they have. So defensively, they were dreadful for most of the year, although they did have some moments and they had some guys who started to pop. Now they're losing Anthony orgy, their linebacker, who is one of the league's leading tacklers and, uh, one of the the leaders in forced fumbles, and I think in f- fumbles recovered too. So he made a lot of plays um, for them. He's gone, but they've got some good – C.J. Taylor has got to watch. He's one of the more underrated defenders in the league. He's kind of a hybrid safety slash linebacker. Saw the field a lot more as the season went on and did some stuff in his time. They've got some experience coming back in the back seven. They've got Ricky Wright, Jalen Mahoney. Ethan Barr, Kane Patterson, uh, those guys have played a lot of football. Um, so you've got some guys in spots. Uh, Oreo was really fired up about this, apparently. But He's high on the Vanderbilt defense. I mean, yeah, they, they, they still <laughs> – well, they, they're going to have to find some speed. And they have to find a pass rush. They lost Miles Capers in camp last year. He was supposed to be their best pass rusher. Never played it down. They get him back. But, um, you know, they had B.J. Diacate. Darren Agu, some guys like that who who flashed at times and might be able to help them. But this is one of these things where an, another year in the system, another year in a, a strength and conditioning program, you got a lot of guys coming back. And, and that's where if you're Vanderbilt, you hope you improve, but still not a lot of not a lot of stars on that end, but you do have some experience. And I think that's where maybe they make the jump in year three. Yeah, and I think back to last year because you know, you think about it, they gave up a lot of points, right? And they weren't great, but you know that. I mean, look, they gave up the points to 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 some really good offenses, right? I mean, they gave yeah. up what the, the three in a row. They got fifty five to Alabama, maybe three of the best five offenses in the country. Yeah, perhaps. you know, fifty two to Ole Miss, fifty five to Georgia, fifty six to Tennessee. But I mean, it's like, man, that's. I mean, those are all pretty good offenses. I mean, at the time, Ole Miss was playing well, so. Yeah, so, I mean, you can certainly look at it and say, well, maybe that's a reason. But like you said, too, I think it's speed is a big thing, obviously, in this league. And finding that, knowing what you're going to have to go against once you do get an SEC play, that that certainly is a big priority, I think, for, for Clark Lee and his staff here and trying to, to figure out that problem. But, but I mean, you mentioned, I mean, like a C.J. Taylor and guys like that coming back. I mean, they've got – they have guys that were – I got a lot Productive. of guys that have played a lot of football. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm looking down their tackle sheet from last year. Let's see. They've got their number two, three, four tacklers coming back. Um, Bars coming along back with Patterson. seven, eight, nine, yeah. ten, eleven, twelve. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. And some, and there'll be some younger guys. They redshirted a lot of younger guys on the back end that are probably better athletes than they had. And those guys will, be, and that's what they're going to be under Clark Lee. It's going to be a developmental program. They're not offering money to kids in NIL. They they use that all in retention. So it's going to be kind of like Wake Forest would be a good model to what they're trying to do. Where Wake redshirts nearly most of those kids. Now they couldn't do that. They just had so many gaping holes. They had to play a lot of freshmen in particular on special teams. But if, if you want to think of how they're going to build 
Wake is probably a good model for what Vanderbilt will try to do under Clark Lee. Yeah, I'm I'm interested to see, like I said, defensively what what that. I mean, losing Anthony Orgy is big. I mean, because again, you talk about a guy that you know you know what he's capable of, but still having that many guys coming back that that do have some experience and have now been in, you know, they they have a you know a year or whatever of learning under Clark Lee, and now you kind of get that extra off season. Now you go into it and. Um, so yeah, I think there's reason to be optimistic. You talked about the speed issue and, and that they're still going to be, you know, look still against, you know, the, the Georgias and teams like that and Tennessee's it's probably still going to catch up to you in those kind of ones, but it's, you know, it's just wondering, all right, can we do enough? Can we just develop these guys another off season, another year and just be a little bit better? And then just maybe, maybe that's the difference, right? When you play a, a Kentucky again, a Florida again, Missouri, Something else to think about with Vanderbilt heading into next season, right? That is their first three SEC games next year. And I was looking at that the other day. Kentucky, Missouri, Florida, their first three SEC games. Two of those three are at home. Um, so yeah. you're, you know, you're talking about a team that again, if the offense is kind of where we think it could be, if they can figure out what they're going to do at running back, if AJ Swan is, you know, even better as a sophomore, you know, we saw it the flashes as a freshman, of course. And then if the defense can just all of these returners who at least have some experience just get a little bit better and get a little more comfortable in what they're going to try to do, you know, schematically to to counter some of the issues they may have with, you know, certain areas. But yeah, I mean, it's again, I think there's there's way more reason for optimism right now on both sides of the ball, even with some guys that they lost um, than there has been going into another offseason in a while. Right. I think that's probably the best way yeah. to put it. Um, you know, I just, because again, there are some things you can at least lean on and again, they, they exceeded expectation the last year, I think just winning, but winning two SEC games period. And so, yeah, it's, there's reason for optimism. Well, I'm going to connect the dots on a couple of things here because with Vanderbilt, it's always a matter of, of talent, but it, it's also a between the ears component when you have not had a winning season since James Franklin left, which has now been nine years. Yeah. When you are consistently outnumbered in your own stadium, I cannot remember the last time. Um, it probably was Missouri uh, that that Vanderbilt actually outnumbered their fans, outnumbered SEC fans in their own building. It's demoralizing. There, no, they will play. They will play next year with both end zones torn up. Uh, the closed end zone will be gone, so you can see that Vanderbilt has started the process of, of rebuilding, but. Last year, I think the thing that we wondered is like the, the Georgia, Alabama, Ole Miss gauntlet where they just got their spirits crushed. That's enough to crush most teams. But let's not forget they won at Kentucky in against Florida after those had happened. Yeah. So I, I think that speaks to some resiliency. And I'm, I'm going to do a little exercise here, okay? I'm not saying they'll be favored in all these games. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read down the schedule in order of which it's played. And you tell me a game. You tell me when there's a game that they can't win. I've they're, already they're done not this, Chris. I'm these. ready for this. I did this okay. the other day. I'm ready for it. Hawaii at home, winnable. Alabama a And M at home, winnable. At Wake Forest, no Sam winnable. Hartman, and uh, at UNLV, winnable. Kentucky no Bobby P home. there. <laughs> no Bobby winnable. P. That's right. Winnable. Uh, uh, Missouri at home. Actually, I'm gonna. You know what? I'm gonna. I, I think Kentucky's going to be tough. So I, I think it's it's winnable, but I think Kentucky is on a revenge tour yeah. next year. Um, Probably so. That, Missouri, tough, Missouri here. Winnable. Missouri and Nashville. Uh, Florida and Gainesville. Mm, winnable. I mean. <laughs> I've seen Florida's – yeah, Florida's got a lot of work to do between now and the fall. Yeah. Uh, losing personnel. I, I would say the winnable. Toughest, Kentucky's the toughest of that group. Yeah, I think. Uh, Georgia well, in Nashville, forget next. it. But, okay, we, we have now gone one, two, three, four, five. It's the first seven games, yeah. you cannot automatically dismiss as not winnable. Yeah. Then a bye week at Ole Miss, that will be tough. Auburn here, I, mm. I think if I'm Vanderbilt, I'd rather have Auburn earlier in the year. They get them later. Yeah. In the year. That, that's, that's a wild card. At South Carolina. Last uh, five are tough. Well, they, they never beat South Carolina and then at Tennessee. Yeah. So it gets tougher in, you know, Halloween ish after. But, um, it's nice to have those two to, off weeks, though. 
Like, yeah. nice to have those two off weeks later, I think, in that in between those last five versus maybe yeah. earlier. So it's not right. it's a it's a good setup, I think, scheduling wise. Yeah, that's what I was looking yeah. at the other day. I was like, I think this is sets up not too bad. So, yeah, don't don't know what the over under on Vanderbilt wins will be, but uh, it was a it was a value last year at two and a half. And um, I'm, I'm guessing maybe around four. I was going to say that, four that and a half. It might be a value yeah. this year, too. So just maybe, saying. maybe we'll get into it a lot more, though. It's uh, yeah, I, there's some intrigue around Vanderbilt football heading into the season and hadn't been in a while, perhaps. Yeah, it's been, been a while since we could say that. OK, we are previewing every single team for the 2023 season. We're doing these in January, so a lot can change. We will update people closer to the season. We've kicked off baseball coverage. We're doing basketball stuff pretty much six days a week, um, five to six. Best way to find that all, subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, and hit that like button too. That Both those things help us. He's Blake Lovell. I'm Chris Lee. We're Southeastern 14. We'll see you again soon.